we'll move to our next speaker, who is Professor Cynthia Rudin from Duke University. She is a professor of computer science, electrical and computer engineering, statistical science and biostatistics and bioinformatics, and she leads Prediction Lab, an our prediction analysis lab. And so in her copious free time after all that, she kindly agreed to talk to us. So Cynthia, it's all yours. Sure. Thank you. You know, there is a lot of bad stuff happening now. There are bad bail and parole decisions being made because people type the wrong number into a black box model. This article is about exactly that type of case where a person's um, criminal history information was entered into a black box model incorrectly and this person was denied parole and given years of extra prison time. Um, and I think these decisions should be made by judges um, rather than um, typographical errors. Um, there are bad medical diagnosis and screening problems. This article, um, which just came out in April, is about the fact that FDA approved uh, machine learning models when, when people brought them into real practice. Um, all of a sudden, they didn't behave the way that they um, were behaving before the FDA approved them. Um, so they just, you know, they tried them in the real world and they just didn't work as well. And no one knows why. And there are bad credit and loan decisions being made based on, um, you know, factors that are not allowed. And they're sometimes being made on faulty information. And I claim that explainable machine learning perpetuates this problem. Now, I want to make a distinction between ex explanations of black boxes and interpretable machine learning. Now, um, ex interpretable machine learning is where um, an, an interpretable machine learning model obeys a domain specific set of constraints that makes its computations easier to understand. So interpretable machine learning is when you use a model that is not a black box. And I want to contrast that with ex what's typically called explainable machine learning, which is where you use a black box and explain it afterwards, like as a post hoc analysis. So you would start with a black box. And then you either create another model that approximates the black box or you compute the derivatives of the black box or you visualize what part of the input the model is paying attention to or you, you know, do any number of other things that essentially make an excuse for the model's existence. Okay, so I claim these two things are really, really different from each other. And, um, you know, wh why am I saying there's such a chasm between these these two things? Because they sound almost the same. Like a lot of people really can't tell the difference, you know, explain a black box versus forget the black box. Um, why, why is that different? Um, or why, you know, what's the argument for, for sort of forgetting the black box and using an interpretable model? And I think the most important argument is that for, um, for a huge number of data science problems, um, we actually don't need black box models in the first place. So they're being used um, in cases when you don't need them. And um, you could just have used an interpretable model instead. And then when you're explaining a black box, you're using an explanation method that lends authority to it. And these explanation methods are flawed. They tend to give you incomplete or misleading um, explanations uh, for a, a lot of the time. And I've seen this myself um, with with like when we're when we're looking at neural networks. Um, so I want to um, I want to go back to the first point, which is the fact that, you know, we just we, we don't need black bottles, black box bottles in the first place for a lot of problems. And I want to bring up this plot that somehow everyone has and not everyone, but a lot of people have in their mind, which is that there is a trade off that you have to make between accuracy and interpretability. And I claim that there's not really any scientific evidence for this claim. Like there's no real honest to goodness scientific evidence for it. Although a lot of people just, just sort of think that it must be true. Um, so this, this figure is from the DARPA Explainable AI BAA. And what it seems to be indicating is that as your learning performance improves, your ability to explain um, gets worse. And as you um, are able to explain really well, um, your learning performance gets worse. Um, and I have a lot of issues with this plot. The first one being that the axes have no quantification. Like it looks like someone drew this plot. Um, like I don't even know what explanation effectiveness means. Um, it's just not quantified. I, this figure doesn't seem to correspond to any real data set. It's kind of like, you know, Trump with the Sharpie or something like that. Okay. so. 
the second issue I have with this data set, it, or this um, figure, is that it seems to be constructed from a static data set. So it seems like someone ran a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms and plotted it and changed, you know, changed something in the algorithms to have a data point for accuracy and um, explanation effectiveness, um, which is the way we might typically do like Kaggle competitions. But this is not the way that the typical data science process works. Um, in a typical data science process, like the KDD process that I have on the bottom of the screen, you would typically analyze the result afterward and then use that interpretation to go back and fix the data or fix the evaluation metric. And so in that sense, being able to actually understand what the model is doing allows you to do a better job in the full data science process. So that's another reason that this figure is misleading. And um, also, the trade-off doesn't actually happen like this. Like for most data sets that I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot of data sets, um, it's actually fairly flat. Like you can actually get really uh, accurate models that are also very, um, very interpretable. And then the last point is that it's not really clear what this figure is even talking about. Are they talking about explaining black boxes or are they talking about designing inherently interpretable models? And the answer is that in this figure, I think they were talking about explaining black boxes. Now, there is some subtlety to this argument um, that I'm making, which is that um, there are really two different types of problems that we deal with in machine learning. There's problems with tabular data and problems with uh, raw data. So tabular data looks kind of like that, where, the, um, where it's a, kind of a naturally good data representation. You would have features, um, you have uh, categorical or real valued uh, uh, values for those features. Um, and for those types of data, um, lots of machine learning methods tend to perform very, very similarly, as long as you're willing to do some pre-processing. Whereas for raw data, raw data is kind of like images or sound waves or large amounts of text. Um, for those types of problems where like, you know, one pixel doesn't really tell you anything about the, the what's in the, the picture. Um, for those types of problems, then the only technique that's really working right now is neural networks. And that doesn't mean that's always going to be the way it is, but that's that's the way it is right now. Um, but for tabular data, neural networks don't really seem to give you much of an advantage. Um, and in particular, with minor pre-processing, all the methods tend to have very similar performance. And um, that includes very sparse models. So for instance, very sparse decision trees or very sparse scoring systems. So the fact that tabular data doesn't really seem to benefit from neural networks really kind of creates opportunities for us to create really, really simple models that have the same level of performance as black box models. So um, I want to go to um, an example of a machine learning algorithm that's actually used in a high stakes decision setting. Okay. So this is uh, the problem of preventing brain damage in critically ill patients, okay? So let's say that you have an aneurysm right over here, which is in your brain and it bursts. So you have like a, a kind of a, like a hemorrhage, which is like a blood explosion in your brain. And you go to the hospital and the doctors quickly fix you up and they cover you with uh, these um, EEG monitors, right? So you can continuous EEG monitors. So you're covered with these sensors all over your head. And these sensors are the only way to detect seizures because these seizures are subclinical, which means that the patient is not like shaking or anything like that. So the only way to detect seizures or seizure like activity is through these EEG monitors. And seizures are actually really common in these kinds of patients. Um, these patients um, can suffer serious brain damage from seizures. In fact, the seizures can actually cause worse damage to the brain than the original hemorrhage. And, um, Doctors will do a lot to make sure the patients don't get a seizure. They will even uh, give the patient drugs to kind of turn off part of their brain just so that the patient won't get a seizure because it's really quite quite damaging. Okay, um, the only the, the, a major problem though with detecting uh, detecting these seizures is that um, the EEG monitors are in scarce supply, uh, so they often don't have enough monitors to go around or people to read the monitors. And so they, and the monitors stay way too long on some people and not long enough on, and other people don't get them, right? So it's allocation of these monitors is really important. So in any case, we need to be able to predict these seizures in advance 
to know who should get monitoring and, and, and who doesn't need it. So we worked with neurologists to develop a model called the Two Helps to B score. This model is small enough that it can fit on a PowerPoint slide, but it's as powerful as our best black box machine learning models. So this model, um, it's called Two Helps to B because it's two H-E-L-P-S and then two points for the B. And you add up the points and it translates into a six hour risk of seizure. Now, as I mentioned, Two Helps to B was not created by doctors. It was created by data fed into a machine learning algorithm. Uh, the algorithm chose which features out of its giant pile of 70 some features, it chose only these six, and it chose these particular point scores um, and the probabilities over here. Uh, this model is just as accurate as black box models on this data set. And it doesn't force you to trust it like black box models do. Doctors can decide themselves whether or not they wanna trust it. They can also calibrate the score with information not in the database so that if um, like the doctor looks at the patient and says, oh, there's this information that's not in the database, I think that's worth about a point, so I'm gonna add a point to the patient's score. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the model actually was built from a database of 70 some features, and it just happened to choose these six features for the two helps to be score. Um, the algorithm that produced the two helps to be score looks like this. Um, and, and if you're not a mathematician, that's okay. Um, I, I'll just tell you what it does. So this first term ensures that the model is accurate and well calibrated to the data. Uh, this is the logistic loss that's used in logistic regression. And this is a model size term that keeps the model nice and small and has, you know, it has only six terms, like I said, so it tries to keep the model really small so that a doctor can memorize it. And then this set of constraints over here means that the coefficients have to be between negative 10 and 10. And it happened to choose, you know, one, 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 and two for those coefficients. Now, if you're an optimization expert, you would know that this is a mixed integer nonlinear program that is actually quite difficult to solve. But that is a problem that a computer scientist should have to deal with and not a doctor. Uh, and we've developed our own cutting plane methods to actually solve this problem, and we can solve it within a relatively short time to produce these nice risk scores for doctors. So anyway, now the patient comes in with their first aneurysm and their hemorrhage, they get sewn up, they are monitored with EEG monitors, and the doctor comes by, the neurologist comes by and looks at the monitor and says, I see this, this, and that. That means the person has a two helps to be score of three. So I'm going to place them on continuous EEG monitoring for at least 72 hours, and we'll start them on preventative medications. Okay, now so far, Two Helps to B has been validated on an independent multicenter cohort. Uh, I wasn't involved in the validation study. This was the neurologist who, who did that. And what they found was that it generalized just as well to the, um, this new data set um, as it did to the data that we, um, that we trained it on. And it's been implemented so far at several hospitals and it re resulted in a huge reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient uh, which allowed the doctors to monitor 2.82 times more patients than they had before, which according to the doctors is a really, um, you know, important amount of, you know, that, that's really important because it allowed the doctors to reduce brain damage and save lives. So it's a rare example of machine learning that's actually used in practice in a high stakes setting. And the reason that we could do that is because the model was interpretable. Okay, so I've talked a lot about um, tabular data. So I wanna switch over to talking about raw data for a while. So raw data is more complicated because it's not really clear even what interpretability actually means for raw data. Like what, what does it mean to have an interpretable neural network? Like what, what is that? Do we need to create a black box and explain it or, or can we build an inherently interpretable model? And um, I, first I will tell you what an interpretable deep neural network is not, okay? So an interpretable neural network is not a black box neural network explained with a saliency map. Saliency maps are really popular, but they, they're, I, I just don't think that this is the right way to do things, and here's why. So, um, so saliency maps, they're supposed to give you evidence for you know, why an image was classified a certain way. So in this case, it's highlighting the part of the image that you know, it's using to, um, it, it claims it's using for for um, predicting that this is a Siberian Husky. And you, you say, okay, that looks pretty good. Um, okay, I'll, I'll trust it. 
But then if you ask the same neural network to give you the explanation for why this image it contains a musical instrument, then it highlights almost the same part of the image. So it's really not giving you an explanation for really anything, to be honest. So um, I think we can ask more of our neural networks than, than this, okay? And this problem, by the way, um, this, what this is, is pretty, it's pretty scary because there's a lot of work on saliency maps right now in, um, in radiology. And it's particularly bad for grad cam, which is a, a technique that's fairly popular, um, where people have seen that it highlights all over the place, even if the network is actually using some very specific bit of information. So I think we can ask more of our neural networks. So what if we could create an inherently interpretable deep um, CNN for computer vision that has the accuracy of the regular black box um, neural network? So we've been working on this technique that's um, essentially it, it's case-based reasoning. So it's very similar to K-nearest neighbors, except that it's it's not K-nearest neighbors. Um, it's sort of it's sort of K-nearest parts of prototypical cases. So here's an example of what the algorithm or what the model is doing when it makes a prediction. So this is a test image. It is a, a little bird. And the model is supposed to tell us why this bird is classified as a clay colored sparrow. And what the, what the model does is it highlights different parts of the bird. Um, like here, it's highlighting the area around the head. Um, I've shown two different ways of highlighting. I've shown like this way and also like a little box, but it's the same. And it, and the, and it says, well, I think that this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird. And I know this bird, this is a prototypical clay colored sparrow. And um, this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird. This is also a prototypical clay colored sparrow. Uh, and so because of because I'm seeing all these similarities to these prototypical parts of these birds, that's why I think this bird is a clay colored sparrow. Um, so this is how the network actually reasons. Um, the prototypes are learned. All of this stuff is learned. It doesn't come from a domain expert. It's all learned, um, you know, from a training set. And then the way of making comparisons is also learned from the training set. So when the new image comes in, all of these comparisons are made automatically in the latent space. And um, these two, two parts of prototypes, and those are also learned. Okay. So because the neural network is saying this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that, um, we decided to call the paper this looks like that. Um, and so the, um, what the paper is um, suggesting is that um, we're, what, what, what you can do is take your favorite black box neural network, just you know pick your favorite black box CNN, and add a prototype layer to it just before the last fully connected layer that forces the network to do case-based reasoning. And again, the prototypes are learned during training. So I'm just going to show you a picture of that. So this is, say, your favorite CNN. Um, then we just added this layer right here, which does these comparisons to the prototypes. And we usually have 20 prototypes per class. Um, the number of prototypes can be chosen as a parameter. And the network scans the image, kind of looking for parts of the image that look like each of the you know, parts of each of the prototypes. So let me give you a little more detail on this whole back end of the computation over here. So I'm gonna just show you what this whole thing is doing. All right, so here's a bird. And we wanna know why this bird is classified as a red-bellied woodpecker. So the network says, well, I think this part of the bird is similar to this part of that bird. And I'm gonna give it 6.499 points for how similar this is to that. So that's a really high similarity score, okay? So the similarity score is how similar um, our bird is to the part of the prototype. And then the class connection weight is how important the prototype is to the class, okay? So this, this 6.499 6 comes from the comparison of this to that. And then the 1.18 um, comes from how important this bird is for this, for this uh, red-bellied woodpecker class. And you get 20 of these pairs of numbers and then um, you multiply these up. So you get 20 numbers, you add them up, and that is the number of points you get for the red-bellied woodpecker class. And you do this for all the different classes. So the next highest class, uh, the next highest scoring class is the red cockatiel woodpecker class. 
And the network is doing everything it can to try to figure out all the, all the evidence it can get for why this bird might be a red cockatoid woodpecker. And it's, it's really figured out that like the feathers, the pattern on the feathers is really similar to the prototypes from the red, from the red cockatoid woodpecker class. But apparently red cockatoid woodpeckers don't seem to have red heads. And so it just doesn't gather that important piece of evidence, um, which is the comparison to the head. And so it just can't gather as many points there. And so it concludes that it's, the, it's a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, so we've been working with the Cub 200 data set, which is this benchmark data set in computer vision. It has 200 classes of birds. And we ran a whole bunch of different neural networks on this data set and got the black box accuracy to be between these numbers over here. And then when we um, inserted the prototype layer into all these networks and ran them again, you know, retrained them and ran them again, um, the accuracy we got was still in this, that same range. And then when we stacked the proto peanuts, when, when we stacked these interpretable models, um, we, we still get an interpretable model because it's still using like prototype, com you know, comparisons to prototypes. We actually got um, a neural network that was even more accurate than the baselines and it was still interpretable. So what I'm trying to explain here is that even for computer vision, which is, you know, where the benchmark testing is done in, in, you know, a lot of machine learning, we can still have an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. So we were like, okay, now we proved our point. Um, where, what can we actually do with this now that we've created it? And we decided that we would look into medical imaging problems, like high stakes medical imaging problems, because radiology, um, like I said, it's being taken over by deep learning. And these guys are, are using black boxes and trying to explain them with saliency maps. So we thought, okay, let's at least show them what, you know, we think would be nice to have as like, you know, a, 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 like a better deep learning model for radiology. And hopefully they will come, right? So this is what we created. Um, we've been working with um, a, a medical physicists and radiologists on computational mammography. As you probably know, breast cancer is a leading cause of death in the USA. Hundreds of thousands of cases are diagnosed each year in the USA, causing tens of thousands of deaths. Mammography is the hardest task in all of radiology. Radiologists miss a fifth of breast cancers. Half of women getting an annual mammogram over 10 years will have a false positive. Up to three quarters of biopsies come back as benign, in other words, potentially unnecessary surgeries. That's not so good. Now, there's really two different, there's like at least two different kinds of problems in um, mammography that, um, that are, they're, they're actually very different from each other. And one of them requires interpretability and the other one doesn't. So for instance, uh, a lot of people are working on this problem, which is just, is there a lesion in this breast? And um, the, the black box model is perfectly fine here, right? Because the black box, it'll just say, there's no lesion in this image. And there's no like explanation that you can give. Like, I just didn't see anything there. There's nothing there. Whereas um, the problem that I'm working on is a very difficult decision by a radiologist, which is whether or not the patient should get a biopsy. So the, the a radiologist is looking at this image and they're like, you know, I just, you know, I need to decide whether or not this patient um, should, should be getting surgery for this. Okay, so if we used a black box approach, it would simply give us some kind of score and just say it's, it's benign and there you go. Um, if we were going to use saliency techniques, it would say the probability of malignancy is low. I'll predict benign because blob. And um, this blob is not helpful because we know where the lesion is already. We've already, <laughs> we just took a picture of it. So that's not, that's not really going to help us. So what we've been trying to do instead is to have the network pick out parts of the image and say, you know, the way I'm reasoning about this image is that I think uh, this part of the image looks like this part of that image. And this, this image is a prototypical indistinct margin. It's like a textbook case of an indistinct margin. So I'm going to add um, half a point to the malignancy score because indistinct margins are, are more likely to be malignant. And then it says, well, I think this part of the margin actually looks like um, it's circumscribed. And circumscribed margins are less likely um, to be malignant. And so I'm going to subtract uh, 1.3 from the malignancy score. Okay. So that, that's the kind of thing we're, we're trying to do. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit more detail on it. So here's the image. Um, we have the lesion, and then different parts of the lesion are highlighted. 
Um, and then the, the highlighted parts of the lesion um, are highlighted because they look like something that the network has seen before. And so it's, it's saying, well, I think this looks like that with a similar, similarity score of four. And then it's going to add some amount of points to the um, circumscribed margin class. Okay. And then, so this is just for circumscribed margins, and we do it for all the different uh, margin classes. Okay, um, this is not a black box with an explanation. If it's wrong, um, you know where the what the points were for every comparison that it made. And if you're a radiologist and you can actually read these images, you could actually troubleshoot it in real time, right? I can't troubleshoot it because I can't read these images, but um, radiologists can actually read them. Anyway, so the main um, results from the paper are that the performance that we're seeing is as good or better than um, the uninterpretable models. Um, okay, so I, what I've talked about so far is the fact that in neither of these two cases did I need to create a black box model and explain it. So I, um, I've come to sort of uh, I've come to sort of think that, you know, given the fact that self-driving cars have been killing people, given the fact that these radiology deep learning models are not working as good in practice as we thought they should um, when the FDA approved them, that we should probably be very, very careful. And just when it's a high stakes decision, we should really stop trying to explain black box models and try to use interpretable models instead. Um, and I claim that, you know, if it's a high stakes decision of the kind that requires interpretability or, or an, some understanding of what's going on, then we really should not be using a black box unless no equally accurate interpretable model exists. And there should be a significant effort to find such an interpretable model if you're going to try to explain a black box instead. Um, and I've suggested different types of models that work um, on different types of data. So for tabular data, we can use express decision trees, linear added, linear models, additive models, or even scoring systems, which are tightly constrained linear models, as I showed you with the two helps to be score. And then for raw data, um, I'm proposing that we can potentially learn, use something like interpretable deep neural networks. So um, I just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm putting up here uh, the list of papers that I talked about, including the over on the right here. This is the proto peanut paper, and then this one is its application to digital mammography. And then the one down here is the two helps to be score, and then this is the algorithm that created that score. Um, the top paper is the paper that argues why we should stop explaining black boxes and use interpretable models instead. And then this paper over here is actually a review paper, paper that um, my students and I just finished writing on interpretable machine learning, which has a bunch of challenges in it. So if you're a student or whatever, and you want to work in interpretable machine learning, you can go there and there's like a ton of open problems that are listed. And so I hope you find a problem that excites you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, there are a couple questions. Uh, first one is for the EEG study. Are there metrics on patient outcomes? For example, differences in seizure detected per machine? Um, difference in seizures detected per machine. I think I would have to ask my neurologist colleague about that. I'm not an expert in in um, in EEG in the sense that I don't know if I can answer that question. There's definitely metrics on patient outcomes. Um, there's the MRS score, uh, which which uh, the MRS score is like it goes from one to ten, and patient it, it goes from basically the patient can walk out of the hospital to the patient's dead, and there's like everything in between. And so people usually sort of bin bin MRS score and. Um, so we're, we're trying to sort of um, optimize M MRS score by, by sort of, um, you know, make, making sure that patients um, are, not having are not having seizures, essentially. Um, okay, just, um, just one quick question. Um, in the this looks like that framework, can we also have incorporate something that say this looks like nothing or this looks weird? So I think there's I think those are excellent extensions to the framework. We haven't done that. Um, and I think you, you could. And there have been a number of people who have extended it in interesting directions, but I haven't seen this looks like nothing yet. Um, we do have, unfortunately, uh, every once in a while, we do get a prototype that looks like background, right? And so what that's telling you is that the um, the algorithm is using the background information somehow to figure out what 
what the the bird is. So for instance, if it's a water bird, you'll off, you'll often get a prototype that's just water because it's using the water information to figure out what kind of bird it is. And so what what you can do is you can actually manually prune those those prototypes out if you want. Um, but um, but yeah, those those prototypes are sort of you know this looks like water or this looks like sky or something like that. So it's kind of like this looks like nothing. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, this looks weird. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. I know what that yeah. means. <laughs> we need to move on. Thank you again for a wonderful talk. 